Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So in today's video, we are going to be taking a look at this book here, Friedrich Nietzsche, and it is by Liliane Frey Rohn. Uh, she was a Jungian analyst, one of the first generation of Jungian analysts, uh, along with many, many others. Um, she was fairly close with Jung. Um, I wouldn't say as close as some of the other Jungian analysts, but certainly she had frequent meetings with him and all that sort of stuff. Um, and of course, when a lot of the first generation Jungians had their analysis with Jung, they would generally meet him once a week. Some of them would meet him like two or three times, but it's it was less common for the analysts to meet him that amount. As I say, a lot of them had... Um, kind of an analysis with Jung themselves before they they taught or before they um, ever kind of went into becoming an analyst themselves and uh, a lot of them actually already had PhDs and things like that. Um, a lot of them had kind of been to university for whether it be studying languages, studying philosophy, like Lillian. Lillian studied philosophy and psychology and did a PhD in that. Um, but yeah, lo there's loads of different varieties. Um, of course, C.A. Mayo had done a... Um, I don't think he had an analysis for Jung or anything like that, but he had done um, an MD. He was a psychiatrist, of course. Uh, Dr. Joe Wheelwright, he actually went to Jung before he did um, his medical degree. And then actually, obviously, became an MD um, and then went on to become a, a kind of Jungian analyst. Um, and there's loads of different stories. Marie-Louise von Franz, uh, I think she studied, she studied uh, languages. I can't remember which two she did. Latin was in there. I'm sure Greek was in there as well. Um, but I can't remember the exact title of the degree she did. Um, but she got a PhD in that. So a lot of them had these kind of things going on. Um, before or after they got to Jung. And, of course, many of them uh, did, of course, an analysis with Jung, or if they weren't with Jung, then Jung would send them to Tony Wolf and they would do an analysis with her. That's just a little brief kind of explanation of the whole Jungian inner circle, shall we, shall we say, of the, the different people who were around Jung in the first generation. Generally, people came to him between, it seems to me, between the years of about 1928, 1929 to about 1935, that sort of era. There was a few people in the Jungian inner circle. I think Barbara Hanna was one that was a little bit earlier than that, um, who came to Jung a little bit earlier than that. But a lot of them seem to be in that range. I think uh, Marie-Louise von Franz met Jung in 1933. Uh, Liliane, I think, in 1932. Uh, Joe Wheelwright, I think, was 1929. C.A. Meyer was a little bit different because he had grown up, really, somewhat around Jung or around the young children anyway. And so he was reading Jung and he was uh, absorbing himself in that world since he was very, very young, since he was a teenager. Um, and I think he read Psychological Types when it came out in 1921, when he was, I think he was born in 1905, so he would have been 16 and he read that book and he understood it. And uh, uh, obviously then he went on to do um, a, a medical degree. So, I mean, he, he was... And you can watch him on, on an interview as well, on the Remembering Young interviews, and he talks about all this in the interview. And uh, he, uh, I mean, God, he must have been a bloody bright kid. Like, he would have, he was a really bright kid to to understand all that, like 15, 16, having conversations with Young. Obviously, I don't know what frequency or what depth they went into, um, uh, and had these conversations, but certainly at that time when he was young as well. Um, I mean, it's just mind-blowing, really. But anyway, that's a bit of Jungian backstory. I uh, will go into this book now. So, um, I really like a lot of the female Jungian analysts. Now, a lot of them, of course, they get talked about a bit more these days, to be honest, to give them credit. But uh, a lot of the time, you don't get talked about. A lot of the time, it's Jung. Oh, you know, read Jung, read all Jung's books. It's brilliant. He'll really give you great insight and all the rest of it. And he will. He, honestly, he will. He will. 
But what we've got to remember is that a lot of these Jungian analysts, they were in the shadow of Jung. Now, Jung was brilliant in terms of an, an intellectual force. It doesn't matter whether you want to believe what he said or not. That, it doesn't matter at all. The fact of the matter is, though, he was an intellectual force. He knew so much. And it doesn't matter really whether you want to believe what he produced. That's what he was. He was one of these great men, you know, analogous to people like Plato or Socrates or anyone like that. Any of these greats through history. Kant, or all, all these, you know, real big players. I mean, I think Kant would be doing Jung a little bit of a disservice, actually. But I suppose uh, you could kind of say he's in that realm. But I would actually put Jung further than Kant in a way because his philosophy and his psychology encapsulates God such an expanse of stuff such a range of stuff um, but he was with those sorts of people he's in that clade of people but the thing is he surrounded himself with people who were brilliant who were absolute brilliant I mean you would say geniuses they were at that level they were brilliant um, and We've got people like Marie-Louise von Franz in there who spoke different languages, who knew different languages, who who uh, knew all about alchemy, who knew about physics, who knew about philosophy, all these different things about philosophy, who knew all these things about religion, who knew all of these things. God, in so many different areas, it's, it's ridiculous. And the fact is, if Jung wasn't there and it was it was, the focus was just on her, you would still say she was a blooming genius. Um, and it's the same with Lillianne, really, because she, the expanse of what she knew in psychology and philosophy is just incredible. I mean, absolutely incredible. And the same with so many different other Jungian analysts. I mean, again, case in point, C.A. Mayo is a brilliant one. I mean, incredible, incredible amount of knowledge, incredible man. But yet, because Jung's there, everyone just goes to Jung. Oh, Jung's brilliant. But the fact of the matter is... These were all brilliant people. I often make a joke with myself and kind of say that the collective unconscious released a SEAL team of philosophers and psychologists and psychiatrists in the Jungian uh, world and uh, the, the whole Jungian kind of um, phenomenon in the, you know, between sort of 1925 and 1961, well, even a bit further because obviously the other Jungian survived longer than 61, but about 1925 to maybe 1990, something like that, the whole Jungian thing, it kind of, the collective unconscious released this SEAL team of, of people who brought together all these incredible fields throughout history uh, you know, psychiatry, psychology, alchemy, um, astrology, um, oh God, philosophy, uh, you know, just ridiculous, all sorts of spirituality, religion, uh, all these sorts of things, brought them together and put them into this packaged psychology or packaged philosophy and said, there you go, that's it, that's, you know, <laughs> we've got somewhere now, we've actually got somewhere and, um, and 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 it was it's just ridiculous. So when you look at it like that, it's it's very um, all the others who worked with Jung are very very important. And Jung indeed says that I don't I think it might be in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections uh, that you know he couldn't have done it With, without the all of these other people around him. There's no way he could have done it. You know, it was all, all the different people put together. He was very, very thankful for all of those people coming with him. Um, I think Marie-Louise von Franz says this as well, uh, kind of quoting what he had said, possibly in a conversation to her. Um, and she was quoting this in um, a, an interview of some sort, maybe The Way of the Dream, not The Way of the Dream, um, uh, Matters of the Heart, something like that. I think it might be in that interview. But, you know, of course, he, he was thankful for these people coming along with him because... In his life, he had to give up so many personal friendships. He had to move past them for be, just for the fact of his, his task, just for the fact of what he had to do. Um, and, and he had to let go of so many personal friendships. So those that were kept and that those were people that stayed around him in Zurich um, were, you know, were special to him with the fact that he could have that... Um, and uh, I think it was possibly particularly 
important as well around the time of the death of his wife. I believe it was 55 Emma Young died because I always get it mixed up with Tony Wolf. Tony Wolf, I think, was 53, Emma was 55, but sometimes I say Tony Wolf was 55 and Emma was 53, but I don't think it's that way around. Um, but yeah, I mean, those couple of years losing Tony Wolf and losing his wife, um, I think it was particularly important that he had that group of people around him. Um, because that was, especially in 55 when he lost his wife, that was a particularly hard time. And he says somewhere, and again, I don't know where this is, it very well could be in memories, dreams and reflections, that he needed to find himself. It was more important than ever after 55, after his wife died, to find himself. And um, I remember one of the young analysts, I think it may have been uh, Lillian, may have been Lillian, uh, went to Young um, after the death of his wife. It might have been Marie or it might have been Lillian. I can't remember exactly. But one of them went to Young um, after the death of his wife and he was there crying. And it really did. It massively affected him, massively impacted him. And, of course, one of the famous quotes from Young is that uh, talking as, of his wife, he, he said that Emma Young was a queen, um, and I think really the, there's some sort of sentiment in that of uh, kind of being around him despite his polyamorous tendency, I suppose, or despite his kind of tendency to to have had or, or to even gone down that route of having a relationship with Tony. I think there's there, there was a little bit, there's a hint of that in there of kind of saying that, well, you know, she put up with that in a sense and... Uh, and uh, even accepted it, even accepted it, really. And uh, so there's a hint of that in there, but also there's a there's a real hint of of kind of the animo in that in that quote as well, in just saying that you know she was this woman who kind of encapsulated possibly for him the loyalty of the anima. Maybe more so, I mean, I'm just speculating here, and, and of course I've read quite a bit on Jung, so I kind of can speculate a little bit in, in maybe what he what he thought, but, um, and maybe I'll be better at doing that when I'm, when I'm older and when I've understood it even more, but um, possibly she encapsulated the loyalty of the anima for him more, let's say, than Tony, because of that lifetime dedication to him and his work and to and to her own part in that, you know, um, and, and these days, of course, it, it's, uh, you know, that sort of loyalty of the anima type thing, that kind of uh, feminine spiritrice, if you will, um, it, it's kind of, in my view, it needs to be a, I've often said, um, in just thinking myself, not really on video or anything, but it needs to be a reciprocal relationship, so the, the man is a male in spiritrice for the woman, and the woman is a feminine spiritrice for the man. And so it's more equal. You know, it, talking in a modern 21st century uh, way of speaking, rather than it just being the woman. But in a more traditional, you know, in that more traditional early Jungian idea based upon um, this kind of very instinctual, uh, archetypal ideas, you would say, you know, it's the, the feminine is the more loyal, da 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 But the problem with that in a 21st century view is that we get into this kind of idea of, well, is the woman just there to serve the man? You know, and it's not that. You know, we can, we can very much have a reciprocal and equal relationship where the man uh, has... Almost, it, it, almost his anima. Let's say his anima becomes the loyalty to the to the woman in the relationship, and then of course the woman's conscious anima is the loyalty to the man. And you can also extend that to the animus in the sense that the the woman's animus, you know, and, and especially when her animus is more developed, a woman's animus becomes the spirit, um, in a sense, for the man's anima. It's, and I've seen this happen. I mean, it's not particularly 100% healthy when this happens, actually, but I've seen it happen. Where, let's say, a man is... In, if a woman can get more of a relationship with a more philosophical side of her animus, 
and and also a bit of a spirit that comes along with that. When a man's in more of an anima mood, she can use her positive relationship with the animus, with her own animus, to kind of stimulate something within him to to get him back up and to get him out of the anima mood. You know, there's there's things in that, but sometimes that's it seems to be just in an empirical observation that sometimes that's not actually healthy sometimes it can be more uh, of a of a positive thing sometimes it can be a more of a, a negative thing and of course there's there's negatives that can come off that quite easily um but no i think that that's in that quote that is what he was saying but of course uh lillian mentioned in remembering young that after the death of his wife he really started to absorb himself in zen more and uh, I've often wondered when Jung actually started to learn about Zen. Because I think he probably learnt about it early on. Maybe in the 20s or, you know, the, uh, yeah, maybe something like that. Or maybe even less, maybe way less than that. Um, but I think in the 50s he was kind of revisiting Zen. He was coming back to it and he was really absorbing himself in it in a in a stronger way, because uh, Lillian says that he got into Zen, you know, at that point, but I can't reconcile in my own mind, I suppose, the idea that he wouldn't have already known things about it, especially with regards to the fact that um, in the, I don't know what year it was, I want to say 1925, but I don't think it was 1925, I think it might have been a bit later, uh, where we did the introduction or preface or maybe even a part of the book with Richard uh, Wel Wilhelm uh, on The Secret of the Golden Flower, which is a Taoist text. And, it, you know, it's kind of got alchemical themes and stuff in there as well. And, uh, well, it is a Taoist alchemical text. Um, but I think because he knew that, you know, he knew about Taoism back then and all the rest of it, he would have read some books on Zen. He would have known Zen. But uh, I think maybe in the 50s he was revisiting it and he was really absorbing himself in it more fully because of the death of his wife and he wanted to use that as kind of like a um, a way to understand himself more. Um, and of course, there's, me there's so much Zen, just as a an idea of Zen, let's say, there's so much of that within the Jungian tradition anyway. Um, so much, you know, a huge amount. And the integration of the, the structures, the anima, the animus, the shadow, things like that, the the flow of the structures and the ability to, to actually kind of um, integrate those structures and to get over certain complexes and things like that and certain neurotic tendencies it actually frees up kind of this this psych and actually Jung calls it psychic flow. He says actually um, that my uh, psychology seeks to promote a, a psychic flow within the individual, which is to say that they're not impeded, they're never never impeded by anything that comes into them. And in Zen, there's a concept called uh, it's in one of the Zen stories. There's a concept called every minute Zen. There's a young master and uh, he is being taught Zen by this this guru, and he'd been taught it for like five or ten years or something, really rigorously. And uh, one of these masters catches him out on something, and uh, he realizes that that he, he he's not as good as as maybe he he could be at the top level. And so um, what he does is he says, "Right, I'm going to go off and find a new master." and train with them for 10 years, and then I'll achieve what I'm going to call every minute zen. Uh, and that's basically where uh, you've got rid of everything, you know, from a Jungian perspective, you've got rid of all the complexes, you've integrated all your psychic structures, you've realised the mana personality, and you are um, unimpeded by things that people say from the outside. Nothing can kind of make you hesitate and make you kind of... Uh, stammered in your speech in a sense in the sense that you are taken by a complex obviously you know being stammered in your speech or anything that might not represent some sort of lack of psychic flow you can be very much kind of mumbly in your speech and still be a, a mana personality or anything like that because there's two types of being um, uh, of kind of stuttering in your speech there's one type which is where you're taken over by a complex and 
something someone said has triggered something negative inside of you, so you're like kind of, you're a bit kind of like that, you know, but then the next type of stammering in your speech is just kind of because you're you're formulating thoughts and you then you're slowly pushing them through you and so you you kind of have that slight little bit of of kind of um stammering or stuttering in your speech and that's not at all anything so there's two types of that and uh um so young you know kind of uh, he must have known things like that. He must have known things like that. And uh, and there, there's this brilliant concept of... Uh, that brilliant concept of every minute Zen really, really does come into Jungian psychology and really does kind of fit um, that kind of Jungian ethos. And uh, it, it tends to me um, to be, within Zen, the... Let's say the... Um, how do I put it? The kind of acquiring of this every minute Zen, it seems to me, because I'm still working it out, I'm still trying to understand. What you have to do is you have to be honest to the degree that everything inside you, you do not mind being outside of you. That's I know it's a weird way. So imagine all of the things that are negative about you in the shadow, all of the experiences you've had that you're kind of putting up a persona barrier to people, so you don't want them to know about it, or you, you're kind of hiding things away, you have to get it all out, and you have to present it in front of yourself, maybe if you have therapy, then of course present it to your therapist, um, you don't necessarily need to present it all to the world or anything like that, but what you need to get to a point is that you are comfortable with those contents in your psyche from your past that may be negative, so that then whenever anyone asks you a question, there's no reaction there anymore, there's no complex. Whereas if you keep it to yourself, if you're unconscious of it, if you're you're not kind of going through that material and, and, and being happy and comfortable and accepting in it, then there's going to be a negative reaction. Then you've lost it. Then you've not got every minute zen, you know. But you, this is a process towards unpacking all of these things over many years so that then that's the way. And of course... This isn't just that, there's so many more things to it, like training your awareness over time and being able to um, move forward and, 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 and integrate socially with people as well and be able to formulate different social relationships with different people and use those social relationships to gauge your own development, your own psychological development in relation to the things that those other people are saying. Because, of, of course, what's going to happen is people are going to say certain things and they're going to trigger certain things inside you that then you can think, oh, hang on, there was something inside me there that I need to kind of work on, that I need to kind of be more conscious of. And then you you get more conscious of it. Maybe in your, you know, you ask your dreams and then you have a dream and you think, oh, what does that mean? And, and you interpret it and, and then you get more and more and more awareness and the psychic structure, well, what I call the psychic structures, which is just the anima, animus, all the rest of it, um, the psychic structures come in together to to the self and integrate with the self and, and that's the wholeness of the personality, both the unconscious part and the conscious part, which we call your ego, uh, which is just your conscious awareness. And so... Um, that is kind of how you can formulate over years and years and years, but it's a process and it's a it's a thing that it's consistent awareness and it's consistent moving forward, moving forward, moving forward. So anyway, I'll leave it there. That's uh, the pre-ramble done. Let's get on with a look at this book. Now, so this is about Nietzsche. It's a psychological approach to Nietzsche's life and work. Now, the one thing I want to note about this book, apart from it being really good, a really informative, really nice read as well, uh, I didn't find, there was, a, there was a couple of pages here and there that I found somewhat challenging, but most of it was quite a nice, 
I wouldn't say really easy weed, but a nice weed, you know? It's just the level you want for weed. It's not it's not too easy that you're kind of thinking, well, there's not really an intellectual challenge in this, but it's not too hard where you're saying, oh, God, I can't even understand this. It's not like reading some pages of Jung where you're like, oh, God, what the hell is he going off on now? What the hell does he mean? And then other pages you think, oh, actually, no, I can understand this. Well, okay, he's just doing a bit on crowd psychology. I've, I've got this. I've grasped this. Um, but then, you know, another few pages later, he's doing some bloody massive ramble about um, all sorts of different archetypal ideas and themes and how they relate to this thing in the 14th century and this thing in the... Oh, my God, some pages of Jung. I mean, some pages in archetypes from the collective unconscious, you're just like, uh, I don't know. It's okay, okay, I'll take your word for it. You know, it's like, and you're looking at it, you're looking at it, and it's got about 16 different references over about four, three or four pages, or even more, and he's referencing all these different things, like philosophical concepts from way back when, and and psychological concepts, and all this sort of stuff, like melted into one kind of argument that is like almost bloody. It seems like it's almost bulletproof. That's what it's like. It's like you read it and you're like, okay, you've you've done your it. Yeah, you've you've got it down. All right. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. And you just try and have to go back and go back and think, okay, so can I understand? Have I got this? Have I got this? So it can be quite crazy. But this book isn't like that. It's nice. It's nice. It's nice. Um, but there was a couple of pages where she went quite deep and I could somewhat follow, but it was hard. Um, and uh, so, but, but it was okay. Now, the main theme in this book is really, it, it, it takes you through all of Nietzsche's work. It gives you a bit of a timeline as well, in a sense. It, 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 it kind of looks at all the different points in his life and kind of, obviously, you get a, a good biography as well in terms of like the... Uh, certainly like the early part of his life and moving through and then when he kind of left his professorship and all that sort of stuff and then kind of, um, he, you know, he went into being a, a kind of, uh, what do you call it, an independent philosopher, obviously on his travels and stuff, going to different places and going traveling when the climate was better and all that sort of stuff so it suited his illness. Um, you get all that sort of stuff in there but you get broken down bits of the different relative works of his and that's brilliant and what one of the main focuses of this book is is his um delusions and how they kind of started to get worse and worse over time and more and more we got to sort of that 1888 1889 period and uh, we really see these delusions building up and we start to see especially when uh Lillian talks about the Zarathustra period and how the the certain um things within let's say Nietzsche's um characters that basically really highlight his delusions and she talks a lot about how uh Zarathustra and and she actually makes the well makes the point of Zarathustra hyphen Nietzsche um he was kind of identifying with this archetypal theme, shall we say, of Zarathustra. And, uh, of course, he had an image of Zarathustra in his mind. He had that kind of imagistic formulation there, uh, which is a, a sort of representation of an archetype. And when he would have been writing scenes on Zarathustra, he, was, he would be getting these kind of imagistic fantasies that would be running through his mind. And those were, that was the archetype in a sense. And he was... He would have been kind of, in my personal opinion, associating himself with that as he was writing it, but on a very, very deep level and possibly on quite an unconscious level as well to, to a degree. Um, and he would be writing it. And it was almost as if his actions were Zarathustra's actions or vice versa. And um, I think that wouldn't have done him any good. I think that would have actually made him more um, uh, more identified with this this archetypal image of this Superman or this hero that he idolised, and uh, he would have then uh, that would have only enhanced his his delusions and all of the rest of it. Um, now she does talk a little bit about this in Nietzsche's kind of maybe poor relationship with his father and his ability or his kind of. Um, 
projection onto different people in his life of those kind of father figures and father idolization. Um, she also kind of touches upon this uh, um, idea of uh, projecting this goddess onto women and kind of his, I think there's maybe even a quote from Nietzsche in here about kind of his inability to love properly, shall we say. And there's a lot in Nietzsche. I've always felt very, very close to Nietzsche and it, it's weird. Um, and and even before I knew about Nietzsche, even in my teenage years, I kind of, looking back now, I feel like I was almost possessed by the spirit of Nietzsche. I was possessed by that kind of individual archetypal idea of, of which Nietzsche kind of, um, I suppose, consciously portrayed to the world and and, and individualized a specific archetypal theme in, in kind of his way. And I feel I'm, I was kind of even before I knew him, I was kind of similar to that, and I was kind of, not in his, not in what he did or anything like that, but I mean just the, the raw nature of that kind of personality and that kind of way of thinking and all that sort of stuff, and uh, so whenever I, whenever I read a book like that, or I've read a couple of books of Nietzsche's, whenever I do that, I think to myself, uh, you know, I feel a very strong connection here, and a lot of the things that he felt I felt, and I think that's a product of my neurosis and a product of what he had experienced in his life as well, uh, in the sense that there are collective um, similarities in in a neurotic standpoint. And, uh, you know, things like, for example, Nietzsche's goddess projection and, and his inability to love, there's a lot of that within myself, and that certainly when I was younger, there was a lot more of it as well, and so uh, a lot of that I am very, very close with, and uh, uh, a lot of this father idolization and things like that, again, it, there's so much in Nietzsche, and, and he, he talks about um, this kind of um, idea of Ariadne, I think it is, who's the wife, kind of, I think when I was doing a bit of research, she's like the almost disfigured wife of of um, Dionysus, and if that's the case, and I would have to do a bit more research here, so please don't quote me on this or anything, I'd go away and do your own research on Ariadne, because Ariadne, I don't know whether I'm talking out my arse or anything here, but if Ariadne is, uh, is that kind of more disfigured wife of Dionysus, she very well could be a, 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 a negative manifestation of the um, the kind of feminine. Now, if Nietzsche did have some sort of psychic splitting, which we, you know, we don't know particularly, it could be the case, um, but if he did, then he wouldn't be able to reconcile that kind of goddess image that he was projecting out onto these the, the feminine, but also he wouldn't be able to recon reconcile that negative part of the feminine, the possessive instincts, which possibly could have been a, uh, a kind of flickering back and forth in the same image or in two slightly distinct images of Ariadne, one being the goddess projection, one being the possessive projection. And he he project out he projected out Ariadne onto Cosma Wagner um and that's kind of alluded to in his insane scribblings as they're called or is they maybe informally called uh, and Lillian talks about that in here as well and so he's likely got this projection and he, he he's kind of battling with it and he's battling with it his entire life because he's constantly projecting these goddess ideals of that kind of archetype but he's also got in, in kind of like a, a the different side the flip side if you were to flip a coin the flip side of that archetype he's got this kind of disfigured possessive horrible negative side of the feminine but, but the, he can't reconcile the two completely it's possible that that was also playing in his life and that that was part of part of his life and you know there's people who said who quoted uh and who you can research you said basically that he didn't really touch a woman he didn't really go down that route and then there's all these claims of homosexuality i'm not going to go into that too much i don't know it may be the case it may not be the case i i i really i'm not going to comment on that too much um the idea of uh, 
father idolization, hero idolization in Z uh, Zarathustra, and his hero idolization of different people in his life, you could draw one interpretation, and please bear in mind, one interpretation, that that is kind of a longing for some sort of masculine element inside of himself, and he's kind of real aggressive stance and his kind of real shadowy masculine stance in sort of his works that are very kind of uh, anti-Christian and very kind of bold in their expression, uh, that could actually denote some sort of lack of integration with his masculinity. Now, if he was projecting out his father uh, ideals, which we know he was, there could have been a tendency towards homosexuality because of the fact uh, he's seeking for that masculine outside himself that he doesn't really accept in himself, but yet he is uh, almost, in, in a way, paradoxically, he is very much um, expressing and he's very much a part of his personality, but he, he, he might not be able to see it fully because he's projecting out onto these people and also he's spouting off and he's it's kind of in the shadow more and he's spouting off at these people, but... But then again, we've got to also give Nietzsche the, the credit that he was incredibly aware of himself, more so than myself or, or other people, uh, at least I would say. Again, we don't know how much his neurosis was making him unconscious, so you don't know about these things fully. He might have been blinded to even the simplest things that maybe someone else could pick up on, because that's generally how unconsciousness works. Uh, you might be unconscious of something uh, that that's easily pointed out by someone else who isn't even a psychologist, you know, so it's kind of that, um, but no, there could have been some sort of homosexuality, or on the flip side of that, it could have just been a, a father projection that doesn't involve uh, sexuality at all, and, and could have just been a kind of lack of integration with, uh, with, with kind of feeling himself, being himself, who he is, and grounded in who he is, and he's just, he's never got over a father, he's never like atoned with that father completely, so, you know, there's many, many different ideas that we could have here, uh, homosexuality or that side of things is merely but one, um, and of course the correct thing for him to do would have been, if, you know, if he was that way, then was to simply reconcile with it and say, that's, that's my sexuality, that is who I am, and uh, I need to accept that, I need to go down that route, I need to explore that route, I need to uh, understand that side of myself, because I think that that would, would have given him uh, more of a balance of, of kind of uh, instinctual tendencies within him, shall we say, and you just say, that's, that's who I am. But the thing is, of course, it was a different time, homosexuality was illegal, all that sort of stuff, so it, it was even harder back then to be able just to say, well, no, this is who I am, you can't, you couldn't do that then, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really a thing, so or if it was a thing, then, uh, God, you know, you'd be going somewhere, so, and somewhere bad, so, um, which is, of course, an awful shame for the, for the times, but that was just the times, um, so, yeah, I think that there was, there was those things there, but, you know, what is brilliant in this book is it really does document so much. It documents his kind of relationships with, with Wagner. It documents his relationships with, with different people in his life. It documents his relationships um, with Lou, uh, I'm going to pronounce her name wrong, Lou Salome or something like that anyway. Um, it documents his kind of, again, a goddess projection onto her and wanting, and I think he proposed to her, I, don't, I think it was more than once actually, I think he proposed to her like two or three times, and uh, so, you know, it documents all that in there, and um, it, it documents these kind of things of what really his life was, and I think it was, not only was it a life filled with suffering, but it was a life filled with, in a sense, in, in one side, there was a sense of overwhelming atonement with himself, but in another sense, there was a, an overwhelming lack of atonement with himself. There was both of those two sides. And you see, I think that is typical of this possible psychic splitting as well, because, you see, on the one side, in later works, in later times, he's writing... Uh, when he's talking about himself, about how he's got this incredible spiritual depth now, and that he really feels himself on the one hand, but then, of course, 
he 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 mustn't be because he's he he ends up obviously going down a a road road, a road of basically insanity, and so you think well. <sighs> There's two sides here, and there's two big things that are blaringly obvious to me. Complete spiritual depth and beautiful atonement with some sort of mystical reality, and then kind of this very, very other side of mental illness. Well, that's, of course, a psychic splitting, because you've got, on the one hand, this side, and on the one hand, that side. It's a, it's a extremist good, extremist evil circumstance in which he's, he's playing out within his psyche. And that's one of the main things that we could say is giving him this incredible turmoil and this incredible kind of um, uh, disequilibrium in, in his psyche. You know, it seems quite obvious as an interpretation or it, as a possible interpretation that that could be the case. But yeah, it is, it is a brilliant book. It really documents also, uh, moving away from maybe his psychology for a minute, but I suppose there's a bit of his psychology inclusive in this, but it documents kind of his thought and his uh, kind of almost war on morality and how in earlier works like Daybreak and things like that, uh, aptly named Daybreak as well, where he's kind of just formulating ideas on morality, formulating kind of these... Um, uh, an understanding of, of uh, where his thoughts lie on morality and, and how that's going to manifest itself throughout later works and all the rest of it. Um, and it really kind of gives you this uh, understanding taken through year by year almost in this book, uh, different works about how these things are formulated and how uh, through certain experiences he's getting this kind of almost, uh, it is almost like a process of individuation in a way. It's almost as if he's being bestowed by the psyche, by his own experiences, by his own intellect as well. Um, this kind of almost process of individuation that allows him to formulate these books that then go to formulate ultimately what we now consider as Nietzsche as an individualized archetypal form, you could say, as an individualized person. Um, and I've often had this idea, and I won't go into it too much here, of uh, individuation after death. Now, that might seem a bit weird, but if you imagine with people like Nietzsche, he didn't get necessarily, or, well, we could say in a degree he got some weird form of individuation, but he didn't really get individuation in its, like, more... Uh, typical setting that's more grounded and more psychologically secure and all the rest of it. But he got, you know, some sort of pseudo-individuation going on there. But then after his death, when we all look back on Nietzsche, we have some sort of idea and we have an image of Nietzsche in our mind and we have some sort of individualized archetypal form there. It's some sort of spirit of Nietzsche, shall we say, some sort of idea there that is a constellation of it, of his personality, of what we understand of his personality. And uh, we kind of almost feel, in a way, or we could feel that he is an individuated person, like he's almost attained some level of individuation after death, as if he's attained this state of a complete personality based on all of the works that he did in his life and that kind of process of his life, the entirety of the process of his life being um, uh, a kind of individual capsule, an individual personality capsule that kind of become individuated after his death. It is, it's an odd concept, it's an odd idea, but it kind of works in a way, it kind of it has that kind of feeling there, and you can kind of understand how it has become a reality in a sense. It's more so that really, like, his his ideas, his spirit, his um, his life has become a imagistic and uh, ideological person uh, personality representation, individualized personality representation of a specific way of being. That's it. Yeah, I know that was a mouthful. But it is like that. It's kind of like his life has become an individualized way of being that is an individualized archetypal form uh, in some sort of 
after death idea of individuation it's very remarkable to think about it in that way um and to think about other people's lives in that way as well it almost feels like you don't attain individuation until you're dead it's not that you necessarily attain it in your life but in fact you have to be dead so that then people can see the entirety of your growth over your life and the the growth of your work out of out of all of your experiences and then put that in the context of the individualized expression of the archetypes that you portray. See what I'm trying to say? So, and the, and the closer to the archetypes you get in terms of an individualized expression of a particular archetype, the more that cements you as that individualized way of being in the collective unconscious and that then gets kind of propagation um, in the ideas of philosophers and in the in the minds of philosophers or well let's say you are just a philosopher uh, in the minds of philosophers in the future that then create their own individuation from the ideas that they gained from your ideas which you gained from the past and not only is there an idea of the archetype in this but there's actually the idea of Richard Dawkins um, meme and like memetics you could actually draw if you're not going to talk about the archetypes you and you want to talk about the meme and memetics if that's more kind of your thing then we could see very much how the meme would come into this the concept of a meme and how it would propagate itself as an idea through this kind of uh, almost process life process of an individual and their kind of individualized way of being and then it propagates itself in another person uh, but in a different way and then it goes out like that uh, but ultimately there's always kind of a a resting idea of the meme ultimately there's always some sort of collective idea of the meme that that sort of individuals kind of take on in a sense it's so it's like almost individuals um portray the meme in a slightly different way in an individualized way and then that goes to propagate in another person but you always have this kind of typical idea of, of the meme um so it's it's quite interesting um but anyway so it really is that's the book uh it is a really good book i would say it's one of those books that you can't read I wouldn't necessarily say to read if you've not done any research in Jungian psychology. I wouldn't necessarily say to read if you have kind of just done, um, you know, it, it might be okay if you've done a small bit of uh, research on Nietzsche, a bit of research in Jungian psychology, then read this book. I wouldn't say if you've done no research, I'd say do a bit of research first, get to know a bit of the Jungian way, get to know a bit of Nietzsche, then read this book. That's probably the best way of doing it. That's what I did. I mean, obviously, I was very much uh, aware of Jungian psychology, read plenty of books on it, watched loads of interviews, read hundreds of quotes of Jung's online, read, done uh, YouTube videos, watched YouTube videos of different um you know these like channels like academy of ideas and things like that i watched all those videos on jung and nietzsche and all that sort of stuff as well um and so and i've read essays of jung's and all that so uh i had a good grounding i knew that uh this book i'd be all right with it but i think that just coming off not knowing anything i'd probably know something before you read this book you don't need to know loads but I would, I would recommend, you know, at least a little bit bit of something about Nietzsche or about, uh, well, more particularly about psychology, Jungian psychology, stuff like that, uh, depth psychology, um, because otherwise it is going to be a bit of a tough read. I think it is kind of aimed at someone who at least knows a bit about that depth psychology and stuff. Um, but no, it is a good read. Um, and you can really get through it quite quickly because it's one of those things that you you like to read, you know, I picked it up and I was, I was absorbed in it, I wanted to read it, you know, some books can be a bit kind of like, oh, it, this is a bit convoluted, or it's a bit, even just it's a bit too hard, and you can kind of get off your reading, um, what's the word, like, you can get off the horse really, and you can think, oh, well, I'm not gonna, uh, I, I want to read something else or something, but um, with this one, it wasn't like that, I could get through it fairly quickly, I could get, I could enjoy it, um, and I enjoyed picking it up. I wanted to pick it up at, at the start of the day. Obviously, I'd do a lot of my reading in the morning. Sometimes I'd read in the afternoon. Um, I read more so in the morning these days, though. 
um, and I'd just want to pick it up and I'd want to read it. So it, it was nice and it really gave me a good um, understanding. In fact, I've just flicked on by happenstance one of the quotes that really stood out to me in this book. And uh, it's this quote from Nietzsche. And it really stood out for me because it's one of the things that I've been talking about in my own, my own book that I'm writing in a minute, uh, as you'll be aware, Revelations of the Self. And um, I have been doing, I've done a lot of empirical study on this, a lot of looking at different people and trying to understand the archetypes and the instincts. And I had got to this understanding. And funnily enough, it wasn't long before reading this book that I'd only just got to that understanding. And I read this quote from Nietzsche and it just cemented it for me and it made me think, yes, I've found someone who said it as well. Um, and I mean, it's these kind of things are implied in Jung, but he just doesn't, in some places, he don't really touch upon it because what we've got to understand about Jung is he was an intuitive type. And I mean, I'm an intuitive type, so that's not bad, you know, so I can read his writing, it's all right. Um if you're a sensation type, it can sometimes be a bit harder to read his writing because you're looking for more detail and more rigorous outline, whereas an intuitive type thinks, oh, well, yes, of course, that's the way, and we go off gut feeling and we write, like, two lines or five lines or whatever on a specific um, thing, a specific phenomenon, and because they've got all that gut feeling and intuition, they, they have been able to condense it down into that little formulated paragraph or whatever but they've not really given that much detail um whereas a sensation type would because they're really sensing the world would break it down more and would write in a more kind of uh let's say an in-depth and even possibly more conscientious manner don't know quite how much conscientiousness would come into the types of intuition and sensation but possibly more in a conscientious manner of a sensation type but not so much, not too much conscientiousness, but more so just being able to write it in a more kind of clarified manner, in a more clear manner, rather than, let's say, in a in a more condensed but uh, pointing out manner, that kind of, you know, it's like an intuitive type will write something that's very quick, uh, very short, but it, it kind of gets the job done, whereas a sensation type will write it and it'll be clear and it'll be that's that that's that that's that that's that and so there's two different angles really um but yeah so with Jung with his kind of intuitive writing he doesn't really include everything he doesn't he doesn't write there and break everything down and all the little nitty gritty every little bit and bob and all the rest of it because he doesn't need to do that. It, it's superfluous anyway. It's just a superfluous thing. But um, being able to understand these things and being able to perceive these things, because Jung is such an intuitive writer, you have to have the experiences yourself. Otherwise, you, you've lost so much of what Jung's kind of not said in a way, but, but is there within experience. So this is a little quote from Nietzsche. Most of the conscious thinking of a philosopher is secretly guided by his instincts. And that is very, very, that's a deep quote. You know, that's a deep quote. And that's a, a part of Jungian psychology that takes a while to get to and takes a while to understand that, that everything within you, all these things that are coming through you, all of these words, all of these thoughts, all of these actions are guided to a lesser or greater extent by the instincts, by the archetypes. And so when you are formulating philosophical discussion, this is the wise old man archetype coming through you, or the wise old woman archetype coming through you, that kind of sage archetype in there. And whenever you're thinking and you're, you're intellectually, you know, kind of uh, deep in rumination and and bringing things to to some sort of clarity, that is that kind of archetype of of, of the intellect in there. That is the the archetype of that that sage in there as well. That that philosophical nature of well, I wonder why this is. You know when and I, I write this in my book as well. When we say the word why or well, I wonder why that is. You see, that's an instinct. That isn't that isn't just, oh, well, I'm just saying I wonder why. That's an actual instinct. 
that's intelligence working within you. That's the the archetype of the sage. Well, I wonder why this is. And then you do the you do the physiological reaction, shall we say, along with that archetype. Well, and it's quite unconscious. And you, you know, I wonder why this is. And you see, that's not you specifically, but that's the instinct. That's the archetype coming through you. Um, and as I say, it can be quite unconscious. Now, of course. There's nothing wrong with that because um, when we're walking around, when we're thinking, when we're doing these things, it's not that we're trying to close down these archetypal reactions or anything like that. Um, And it's very much the case that we actually have to use these archetypal reactions to formulate our individualized expression of them and our individual journey, shall we say. Um, But, uh, you know, at least what we do want to do is get awareness, conscious awareness of those things so we can see when the archetypes are coming through us to either a lesser or a greater extent. Now, we might say the word why and we might not be as much in the archetype at that point, whereas another time we might be deep in philosophical rumination and we might say why and then we're really in that archetype, you see. Because as I've said before, the archetypes are gradiented. The way, the way in which they come through us, we can either be taken by them to a strong degree, or we can just be partially in them to a small degree. And we, the best way of defining this is in the sexual instinct, because when we, uh, when we can feel sexual, we can feel sexual to all varying degrees. You know, we can, well, we can feel a little bit sexual, or we can feel really sexual. And so the, the, the archetype, the instinct, works through us in a, in a, to varying degrees. And it's the same even with things physiologically like hunger. And of course, hunger relates to the, to the archetypes. And one of the archetypes that I realized it, it relates to quite prominently more recently is the shadow. Because of course, when an animal gets hungry and that graduated hunger comes in, if we take it to the extreme... Not only do we get an extreme physiological reaction there in the sense that, uh, you know, our, our stomach is growling and we, we really need food and we're going to, you know, we're going to die if we don't get food at some point. Not only do we have that there, but we also have a, an extreme, a more extreme psychological reaction from the shadow, the instincts for even the instincts of self-preservation are in the shadow when they're constellated around needing to survive and doing anything to survive. You see, that dominance, that kind of self-preservation, that power is in the shadow. And so when we're really, or when an animal, whether it's a human or another animal, when an animal's really, really hungry, getting that physiological reaction there and needing to eat, uh, then the shadow comes out kind of graduated simultaneously. The, The shadow in its kind of expression in consciousness will formulate itself in consciousness gradually over the same period as your hunger increases. So if you're like mildly hungry, you might complain at people. You might, oh, you know, I'm really hungry. You know, I want to, I really want something to eat. And da, da, da. and also that's the anima. That's the anima in there as well. It's not only the shadow, but the anima comes in there, uh, like that kind of anima mood, that kind of really wanting something, wanting something to eat, wanting kind of that, um, uh, desire in that food and all the rest of it, and you're kind of getting that anima mood in there. But aside from that, the shadow's coming out, and it's coming out slowly and slowly and slowly. And uh, and then what happens, of course, as you get more and more and more hungry, you're now like, look, we've got to go and get food. I, I don't care anymore. I'm really, really hungry. Da, da, da. And you see how it's coming out more and more and more. And then uh, y- when you get really hungry, which none of us really ever get to, but imagine like you're really like you're almost dying, you know, like, really bad. Not only are you like, well, I mean, obviously you'll get to a point where you just you just can't function physiologically. So you actually get to a point of just over over exertion and then you, you just become kind of, you'll become more placid and stuff. But, when before just before you get to that point, you're going to be really shadowy, and you're just going to want to tear something apart. You see, so that's like the shadow, the peak of the shadow. But then the shadow won't be able to come out anymore because of the physiological uh, tiredness, the fatigue, the all the rest of it, all of the effects on your body because you've not got the energy there physiologically to to even. Uh, let's say, fire than your ones to be able to be psychologically aggressive or dominant, which then, of course, translates straight away, like I'm doing now, coming out into your 
actions, your physical actions, like being able to go out and grab food and all the rest of it, that's not, you're not going to have the energy for that. So just the same as when you get to that point of uh, shadow, like being really aggressive, after that point, you're you're going to go back the other way. And it's like the yin and yang. It's like you, you go up, 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 maximum aggression. Then your body becomes tired and tired and tired and your shadow recedes and then you just recede and recede and recede and become placid and then possibly die you know so if you're at that that level let's say so it is a yin and yang thing it's like this you know real uh, yin energy of like you know the shadow progressing 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 along with your kind of physio uh, physiological or behavioral reactions and then it flips and it goes into it well i mean not really the yang but it just flips into the opposite of uh, the um, you know, this kind of lethargic, just dying, basically, and not, not got the energy, so it's very, very, very interesting, and it's very interesting how it works, how that kind of opposite flips, and how it moves like that, um, it, it really, really is quite interesting in how uh, that plays out, and you could even speculate as well, and this is just a speculation at the moment, but when you've got this shadow in you, let's say, and you, you're you're getting more and more shadowy with your hunger increasing, um, you tend to actually, uh, when, let's say, you then get food and you eat it and all the rest of it and you're settled, you tend to then be more placid and you tend to be, uh, oh, I'm happy that I've had my food and all that. And then you just, and that, again, is an opposite reaction from the, from the, aggressive, active reaction of the shadow, or oh, I want food and then maybe going out and getting it and all the rest of it. It's a, it's an opposite reaction of, oh, I'm happy now, I'm full, I'm, you know, passive. It's the active and the passive again, and there we could say the, the yin and the yang in a sense, um, or even the yang, it more works actually if you say the yang and the yin, um, because the, the active being the yang, the passive being the yin. Um, and so you... Uh, you get that, and you get that flip, and that's how a physiological reaction works with the archetypes, you see, it's very, 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 very interesting, very, very, um, uh, very, very cool, very, very cool, and you, you can see that physiologically, very, very interesting when you see it physiologically, very, very interesting, but anyway, I'll leave it there, that was this book, I know I've probably done more rambling than book review, well, I have done more rambling than book review, but, you know, what I do with these videos is I come on and I talk about what I talk about because sometimes I have some good ideas and it's best just to get them out rather than me, uh, you know, ignoring the instincts. For example, it's instinctual what I've just done here. I've lived in the archetype of the, the sage, really, the wise old man, and I've just rambled about things and very much that archetypes come through me. And uh, Jung actually has an interesting quote. He said that uh, when he was talking to uh, E.A. Bennett, he said that what I do when I meet someone or when I've got someone in for analysis or anything like that, I don't really say too many pleasantries like, how are you or all this, all the rest of this. What I do is I let the instincts come up. I let the instincts come up through that person. And then, you see, you start to see the archetypes then and you know... You, you, you've got something then, you've got some sort of like empirical data, shall we say, and uh, so that's what I do with these, I mean, I've always done it really, uh, I I mean, it's at the detriment of a specific topic, of course, but what it does allow is it allows just the genuine flow of instincts to come through me, and if I'm doing a philosophy video, of course, I'm in that mindset of that, that instinctual patterning, and so uh, when I'm formulating these intellectual ideas on these videos, it might go off the topic a bit, but that's because, of course, I'm living in that instinct, in that natural mode of being. And, of course, one of the innate tendencies of myself seems to be just to philosophize and to to um, uh, to formulate intellectual ideas and stuff like that. It just seems to be within me. Um, and, uh, of course, there's socialized factors in play there as well, for sure. Um but certainly it seems to be, uh, to a certain degree, within me as an innate tendency. And then I've, I've reinforced it as well over time. 
but yeah so that's what i generally do uh, and it and it allows me to uh, say what I need to say it, from an instinctual or from an archetypal basis. It's just coming through me rather than me trying to consciously kind of uh, move away from that. And oh, one sec. I do need to go anyway at the moment. That's a, that's an alarm reminding me I need to go. So I'm going to leave it there, guys. Thank you very much for watching. And I will see you in the next one. So see you very soon, guys.